our learning spaces, such as classrooms and the metaverse, are just one way of thinking about how we act and interact with each other and our environment. Here at The Learning Planet, we're thinking not just about how we occupy and use physical and digital spaces, but also about ourselves as individuals and as collective actors, not as citizens of nations, but as learners and caretakers of the Earth, our one and only planet. This is why you'll be hearing us referring to ourselves as planetizens rather than citizens. We consider Learning Planet to be a home where all planetizens are welcome. And the festival is the moment of the year we unite to transform education together and to power up for the year ahead. But did you know that the Learning Planet was founded from a partnership between two great global organizations focused on building a better future? That is the Learning Planet Institute and the United Nations Agency, UNESCO. Now, let's hand over to François Taddy, the founder and president of the Learning Planet Institute, and Stefania Giannini, the assistant director general of education at UNESCO, to share their perspectives on planetizenship and the future of education. François, Stefania, over to you. Thank you, Christine. It's uh, an honor and a privilege uh, to be together uh, with Stefania uh, on this day, International Day of Education, I think that you know we have had a fantastic partnership uh, over the years, and you know it's been growing and growing every year. Uh, and for UNESCO, uh, the year that um, has just been um, accomplished has been a fantastic one, and that was uh, thanks to the leadership of Stefania. So I'm really. Uh, honor and privilege to have her uh, with me today because the Transforming Education Summit was a real success. Uh, it was a real success in the gathering of top officials from all over the world, but for me it was even more of a success because 500,000 young people have contributed to uh, a youth declaration that was uh, put forward uh, to the UN Secretary General during the General Assembly uh, of the UN. And that was a very impressive moment to uh, hear their voice, which are very, very concerned and, and you know, very right in the sorts of things that they are asking for that we might come back to. But what impressed me even further um, during the summit that Stefania and her team had organized was the reaction of the UN Secretary General. Uh, Gutierrez, uh, when he received that use declaration, basically said there is four ways to interact with the youth. The first one is to ignore them. The second one is to pretend to listen to them. And we've done one and two for too long, uh, he said. We are starting to do three, which is to have a real dialogue on the future. But what we need to do is to co-construct the future. And, and that is something to be invented. And I think that, you know, Stefania has been spearheading uh, that co-construction uh, within the UNESCO uh, for the education. But I think that, you know, it's a much more general uh, statement that is great digital made, because the world of future of the planet has to be co-designed by the youth. So very much in the spirit of what Kristen uh, just said about planetizenship, I think we need to invent uh, the very notion of planetizenship together with the next generations. And I'm glad that you know, we have a partner uh, like uh, UNESCO and especially Stefania uh, to uh, push forward uh, this agenda. Stefania. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and good, um, Francois, all of you in Paris. Uh, good morning from New York, where I'm connecting and talking today. Uh, and it's a great pleasure, really, to be, to be celebrating uh, with all of you at Learning Planet Institute once again, uh, the third time, actually, uh, through our uh, strong uh, and, uh, and the fantastic partnership, uh, the International Day for Education. That's the reason why I'm, I'm here. And thanks for uh, reminding us uh, to a milestone moment last year when the Secretary General Guterres, as you mentioned, uh, and the Director General Zule of UNESCO actually called the leaders of the world to commit to transform education and to prioritize education, uh, putting uh, uh, this public policy, this uh, tool for uh, uh, change, uh, for building the future we need, the society we need on top of uh, their political agendas, which is not obvious. We must be very honest, Francois. Everybody likes education, 
uh, as a former politician, I know that it's, uh, you know, it's easy to say that uh, uh, what is better than, uh, than uh, educating children, uh, whatever the contest, whatever the country, but when it comes to decide, when it comes to prioritize, when it comes to choose between uh, the, the, the way a country has to go and the investment ha have to be oriented is another story. So I think last year, through this uh, global movement we are building together, we, we made a, a, a huge progress in the roadmap of, uh, of uh, SDG4, our goal within the 2030 agenda. 133 countries uh, uh, committed to transform education. We now have uh, a knowledge hub where we know how governments uh, and communities, teachers, um, educators, uh, uh, civil society, but most importantly, young people on the front line. I was in the room with you uh, on the 19th September where uh, these uh, leaders of the young people movement uh, actually uh, gave uh, hand by hand uh, their declaration to uh, Antonio Guterres. It was really an emotional time because I mean, I like very much also the, the, the very spontaneous way he, he framed a bit the process of approaching young people and keeping young people on board as, as a game changer and not simply people to listen to. And uh, he said something like this, uh, it's time to make young people really responsible as co-creator of the change we need. And uh, everything we are talking about now around this transformation is a new notion of citizenship. We need a new kind of uh, content. We need new kind of way of learning and teaching. And it's not uh, a nice uh, add to keep on top of curriculum when you talk about education for climate change, for instance, when you talk about uh, education for peace, a topic that UNESCO uh, as everybody knows, uh, uh, was working uh, through the decades. And now, unfortunately, having a, a, a tremendous challenge at work in the heart of Europe, once again, uh, which is uh, compromising the political stability all around the world, education for peace uh, is the topic of the day. So uh, we are here uh, to celebrate in New York uh, in, uh, in one hour, more or less, uh, will uh, we'll, uh, make the point of the progress made from September to now. But what is important that once again, uh, young people will, uh, will uh, sit uh, in the driving seat uh, and uh, will, uh, will, uh, will listen to their uh, vision. Uh, we'll see we are, which are their own priorities in the, in the, in the months to come. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, citizenship uh, to be the thought, to be, differently uh, translated in, uh, in, uh, in uh, their education systems is one of the, one of the most important, uh, uh, the relevant topic. Over. Stefania, uh, I, we fully are in line, of course. Um, I, I just want to highlight uh, one contradiction uh, of the link between education and citizenship. Uh, which is that we are not considering the young people as citizens. Okay, so um, the question uh, for me, uh, you know, if you look at the history, and I know you know it very well, um, uh, of citizenship, um, historically it was not an inclusive notion. And to this day, it's not super inclusive. I mean, women have not been uh, citizen for long. Children are still not citizens. Migrants are no citizens uh, uh, when they leave their country. And so this is not an inclusive notion. And the men in arms that were defending the city walls and that kept the power for themselves um, were also separating the humans uh, from nature. So the traditional citizenship is neither inclusive nor ecological nor sustainable. So uh, by redefining uh, the notion, by going for this planetizenship where we have to care not for the city walls, but for the planetary boundaries, uh, and we have to care for uh, ourselves, for others, and for the planet simultaneously. And of course, that doesn't take anything from our local citizenship, but it's sort of a fractal uh, perspective that we have to invent together. And I think that, you know, we could be co-constructing this and, and what comes with this in terms of rights, in terms of abilities to think about the future, in terms of having a voice that is heard uh, at the highest level uh, from, you know, the local 
uh, perspective, all the way to you know the planetary governance, which is today uh, the United Nations. Uh, how would you see uh, such a perspective? Uh, going straight to the point, which is uh, uh, you know uh, overcoming uh, our narrow perspectives. I totally agree with you. Uh, whatever uh, the boundaries, when it comes to define a notion as citizenship is about, uh, according to the boundaries you take, it can be the, the city, can be the nation, uh, the country, can be the region, or the, the entire global community, is still a narrow perspective. So I see for this century uh, the, the, the real global need for an ethics of care, uh, taking care taking care of each other, taking care of the planet, of course, and the environment. Uh, let me say taking care of, uh, of um, com our communities. Going back, uh, the more we, we become uh, planet teasers uh, and not the citizens, and the more we have uh, to take care of our community to respect the cultural diversity. And inclusion, uh, as you mentioned, is the key word which can really uh, put all, connect all these dots together. So I feel optimist uh, in, in the sense that uh, there is a different awareness, maybe because of COVID, maybe key, because the, the, the world uh, actually changed uh, dramatically two years ago and nobody, uh, two years and a half, and nobody, when it comes to education, could imagine that uh, 100 and, and, uh, and sorry, one, 1 billion and, uh, and 500 million uh, uh, children and youth uh, will be uh, out of school because of a virus, uh, right? Uh, jeopardizing uh, uh, our, our world. So I think that we have the different conditions now to work. The problem I see still is to translate these, all these principles, including uh, this beautiful, innovative notion of uh, planetism-ship uh, in uh, to be citizen of the planet and not of uh, uh, you know, a different contest, uh, a narrow one. Uh, how can we do that? Uh, we have some ideas at UNESCO, at UNESCO, as you know, Francois, we discussed many times. Uh, I think that the more some topics will be um, holistically included in the curriculum and uh, in the way teachers are trained, the better. I mentioned already climate change, how you mentioned uh, uh, all the, the, the topics which are uh, around, uh, uh, around uh, the, the, the notion of uh, freedom, peace, tolerance, respect, which can come from philosophy to uh, science. Uh, I mean, uh, you are a biologist. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm an historical classical philologist and linguist by training. So there are different perspectives that can bring new, uh, new real uh, vision uh, into, uh, into our education systems. The most important issue is that political leaders don't forget the commitment they took uh, uh, in, the, in the building next to, to, to this one I'm sitting today uh, a few months ago. And despite the multiple crises the world is facing now, despite the, the, the big challenges that they have to struggle with, they keep uh, this commitment as, uh, as the most important one because educating uh, young people and also adults, which are still very much out of the system in many, many countries, that means out of society, is an absolute priority to make uh, this ethics of care uh, the real new uh, vocabulary for this century. You like very much to innovate about words, uh, through words, I, I do agree. You know, revolutions always start from uh, a different uh, language. And I think that the, the, the language for this century has really to change and education can contribute crucially to this process. You said it beautifully. I think Kristen, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Stefania. 
Thank you so much for Fran to Francois and Stefania for their introduction to planetizenship. And Francois, I know you'll be telling us more about the journey from citizenship to planetizenship in 15 minutes. So we'll see you back here on LPTV again very soon. First, though, William Kennedy is the Senior Program Officer at the United Nations Fund for International Partnerships. As he is based in New York, William has not been able to join us live today, but he has recorded his thoughts for us in a special message. William wants to share with us his perspectives on the need to, for urgent transformation in learning and what was discussed at the Transforming Education Summit that was held at the United Nations in New York just last September. Let's hear William Kennedy's special message for the Learning Planet. It is an honor to address the Learning Planet Festival on the 2023 International Day of Education. I embrace the vision of this festival as an opportunity to reimagine a planet where everyone is empowered to be able to learn and have access to educational opportunities to enable them to reach their true potential, both as individuals and as global citizens. Clearly, there are few more pressing needs today than to transform education so that young people everywhere have access to the knowledge, the skills, and the values needed to thrive in a rapidly changing world. As many of you know, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, convened the UN Transforming Education Summit last September in response to major challenges relating to the relevance of education in a rapidly changing world. The summit was convened at a crucial moment a moment where the right to education is deprived to millions with the COVID-19 pandemic exposing the inequality and fault line of educational access globally. A time when an estimated 840 million young people will leave school in their teenage years with no qualifications for the workplace or of the future. A time of unsustainable production and consumption habits are destroying nature and ecosystems upon which all life depends. As the Secretary General has stated, instead of being the great enabler, education is fast becoming the great divider. Beset by inequalities and struggling to adjust to the needs of the 21st century, education is in crisis. It is in this spirit that the Secretary General urgently called upon the international community to get back to the job of realizing the promise of Sustainable Development Goal 4, namely to secure a quality education for every child on the planet. He emphasized that education must promote the holistic development of all learners while providing them with the tools and confidence they need to realize their aspiration and contribute to their families, their communities, and their societies. The Secretary General further underscored that the transformation of education requires the need to revisit the purposes and curricula of education in the 21st century. To do so, education needs to support learners in four key areas that he identified. First, learning to learn, equipping learners with the ability to acquire both traditional and contemporary foundational skills and to access learning from an early age. Second, learning to live together with a clear focus on global citizenship education, education for sustainable development, and advancing gender equality. Third, learning to do preparing learners for a rapidly changing world of work by embracing the concept of lifelong learning and by focusing on a new set of skills. And fourth, learning to be, by instilling in learners the values and capacities to lead a meaningful life. You'll all be pleased to know that the voices of youth were especially strong and outspoken during the Transforming Education Summit. Young people called for their fundamental right to learn insisting that nothing should be decided about them without them. Nearly a half million youth from 170 countries and territories across the world were consulted in developing a common vision for transforming education in the form of a youth declaration that was presented to the UN Secretary General. The declaration comprises 25 demands, including that decision makers include youth in education related policy design and implementation as partners and not just beneficiaries. In closing, the Transforming Education Summit will only achieve its goals by mobilizing a global movement in which governments, young people, civil society, teachers, business leaders, 
and philanthropists step up together through cross-sector partnerships and collaboration. All sectors of society need to come together to develop a new generation of empathetic and engaged global citizens prepared to contribute to a more peaceful, sustainable, and just world. It is in this spirit that I applaud the leadership of the Learning Planet Institute, UNESCO, and the Learning Planet Alliance for their efforts to develop a global community of practice dedicated to the transformation of education and the co-construction of a learning society. Thank you, and may you have a very successful festival. Thank you, William Kennedy, for sharing that message of urgency around the need to transform education and the four key areas identified at the Transforming Education Summit to support SDG number four, ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong opportunities for all. We've heard many times on LPTV that access to quality education and the need to learn skills to thrive in today's world is a fundamental right. And if you want to learn more about this, make sure you join the DAIS event, Global Voices Model United Nations 2023, that envisions a global community of youth working collectively, both virtually and in situ in real life, to co-create solutions towards the problems that the world is facing. The event is online, and like everything at the festival, it is free. But you do have to be between 14 and 25 in order to participate at that event. So if you're in that age range, make sure you put a reminder on your phone so you don't miss it. It's taking place on this Friday, starting at 12.30 Central European time. And just like all of the events, you can find more information on our festival website or ask us a question on Discord. Continuing the theme of planetisms, we're now going to take a closer look at the importance of women and youth in society. With our next guest, who is well placed to speak on the subject, as she is the former Minister of Labour and ambassador, former ambassador to the OECD for France. Let's now go over to a special message recorded for the Learning Planet Festival by Muriel Penico. Hello. Let me say a few words to introduce myself. I've had the chance to work in NGOs, international companies, French government, and diplomacy. Today, I'm an independent director in both of several global companies and chair of the Sakura Foundation, which supports emerging artists committed to social change. As a Minister of Labor, I led several reforms, in particular on apprenticeship and lifelong learning. The impact has been important in reducing youth unemployment by, multiply, by buying, multiplying by four the number of apprentices and by allowing already 5 million adults to access to vocational training to improve, change or choose freely their professional life. 80% of participants are workers and employers and uh, half are women. All these categories before didn't have access to learning. Learning, I'm convinced of that, is a tool for empowerment, social and economic emancipation, and to fight inequalities of opportunities. As French ambassador to the OECD, I launched and negotiated the IPAC program to measure how effective public policies are to fight climate change. Moreover, I stress the importance of mainstreaming youth and women questions in all our decisions. In the time of COVID, I launched the appeal call for civil mobilization for youth status general, not to the sacrificed generation, signed by 130 civil society leaders, including, of course, Francois Taddy. Since years, I'm convinced that learning will be the big thing of our century. Why? Because the scale and the speed of the triple change we are facing. The first one, obviously, will be the change of the model required to fight climate change, protect biodiversity and oceans. In a word, it's vital to protect the planet and life, including the life of humanity. And to tackle this historical challenge, we will need political courage at all levels, conscious citizenship, social solidarity, innovative technology, 
and a huge transformation of the economy, jobs and skills in all sectors. Agriculture, food processing, energy, industry, transportation, construction and building, waste management, water management, services, etc. Secondly, we have the new digital shift. It was only 25 years ago that everyone used the internet. Some of you were not born. We are just at the start of a new acceleration with artificial intelligence, big data, new level of automation, metaverse, chat GPT, etc. The impact on the future of work and social life will be enormous. And thirdly, there is a demography. The world is basically divided in two parts. The developed aging countries, in, including North America, Europe, Japan and China, where the need for care economy and the scarcity of human resources will increase dramatically. And the biggest part of the world population, which is very young in developing economies, one out of two Africans is less than 20 years old. This can be a huge potential if and only if learning is accessible to all. The need for upskilling and reskilling in the aging countries and for massive education and learning investment in developing countries will be enormous. These three change levers, climate, technology and demography, will generate a huge shift of jobs and skills in the world. Several organizations estimate that 1 billion jobs will be created, destroyed or transformed before 2030. This has never happened in the history of humanity at this scale and at this speed. So we could see the three challenges as only cumulating, making almost impossible to be addressed on time at the scale of the world. We could also consider that we will stay lost in the impossible triangle between ecological, economic and social imperatives, which could converge on the long term, but appear to be very often opposite in the short term. Many conflicts and even wars could be generated by this tension. McCarney, the former governor of Bank of England, calls this contradiction the tragedy of horizons, the tragedy of time horizons. But we could also consider technology as a serious help to solve some of the climate issues. Even more, if humanity has created this big disorder in nature, leading to an enormous risk on health, food and livelihood for billions of people, then our collective imagination, courage and commitment can change the game. I strongly believe, like you, that where there is a will, there is a way. And why is it possible? First, because learning is a non-violent tool, extremely powerful to make change. Learning all the time, every day, connecting and sharing, experimenting, discovering, inventing and shaping the future, that means, of course, a big change in the way we conceive learning. Certainly not just a top-down for classical thing, but I'm sure that we'll discuss that also during the roundtable. And secondly, it's possible because change makers are there, especially youth and women. For the first time in history, we are seeing in Iran a revolutionary movement launched by and for women, followed and supported by men. Women, life, freedom. The Afghan women are fighting for the right to education with the same heroic courage than Iranians. Many studies show that having more women in politics and economic decision-making bodies is a factor of increasing care, planet protection and peace. Why? Probably because culturally, as well as biologically, we women know more deeply the vulnerability and strength of life and the long time required to make it grow safely. Then we are more oriented on the long term. Fortunately, many men are, and more and more also. Greta Thunberg, Peace Nobel Prize Malala, and many others are strong examples 
of this rising leadership. As said Naomi Wolf, women cannot change the world as long as they are uncomfortable with the idea of wielding power. And if they don't understand, they are already powerful. And yours, in all countries in the world, the understanding, concern and commitment to protect the planet is largely spread among young people. If the beautiful expression of François Tadei, planetization, resonates, it's first among young people. Citizenship means partisanship. You don't need to be convinced. You need to be allowed to act, experiment, invent, cobble the future with the previous generations and all fields. As UN General Secretary Antonio Guterres said, we have ignored yours for too long. We need not only to listen to them, but to dialogue and co-build the future with them. Now is the time. Now is the urgency. Now is the possibility of a planetized movement. The long term is urgent. The challenge required is huge. Planet and people are totally linked. Youth and women and all of us can be strong change makers. Let us imagine and co-build the future together. Thank you to Muriel Penico for highlighting the importance of the role of women and youth in our societies and for underlining that learning is a powerful change driver, especially when it enables young people and women to confront challenges and to take the lead in their communities and beyond. Game changers that are empowered with learning and focused on complex challenges embody what we call a planetizenship mindset. And Muriel's message has perfectly set the stage for the main event in our From, Plan From Citizenships to Planetizenship segment. That being the panel discussion led by Francois Teddy, who's the founder and president of the Learning Planet Institute. Francois, over to you to introduce your guests and to lead this discussion strongly what Muriel has said, uh, and I think that we have to co-design our future We're together. What we're actually going to do is just try and restart this panel. Francois, if you can give me a sign, uh, if we can hear you. Can uh, you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, and we can hear you, Francois. Certainly, I'm going to hand over to you now for your citizenship to pan planet citizenship panel. Over to you. Okay. Uh, sorry for the connection problems. Uh, I think that indeed we have to um, codefine, as Muriel was saying, uh, planetizenship with the people that were not invited to the citizenship table historically. So that's women, that's the young people. They are still not invited to the conversation uh, in most countries. And women are not have not been invited in. <laughs> every country until very recently and they had to fight to be uh, heard at the table and unfortunately you know they know the importance of the youth uh, and they want to invite them so now we have ever more people that want to enlarge the conversation uh, on uh, including uh, the youth uh, to redefine what planetism is um, you know citizenship historically was this man in arms defending the city walls. Uh, and you know, while they got the power through their fights, they kept it. Uh, and they didn't want to share that power uh, that much, uh, neither with you know, uh, the migrants or uh, with the women or with the, or with the children. And I think we have to um, do much better than this. And that's why you know, I'm really glad that uh, we can overcome those barriers uh, of the past and we can be much more inclusive and also much more ecological because today it's not so much the city walls we have to defend, but the planetary boundaries that we have to take into consideration. And if we don't want a breakdown of our global ecosystem and therefore a breakdown of our societies, we need a breakthrough in terms of inventing together uh, ways to live on Earth uh, that uh, are compatible with uh, our well-being and one of the future generations. Uh, or well-being as a human species, but also the well-being of, you know, or brothers and sisters uh, from different uh, species. And, and we have to, you know, reinvent those family ties. And, and you know, we've learned to care for each other 
uh, historically at the local level. Can we learn to care for each other at that global level is something to be invented. Uh, it might look utopian, uh, but you know, I think it was somewhat utopic to imagine democracy before Pericles was born in Athens or before Voltaire, Rousseau, and others were born in the 18th century um, for the national level of citizenship and democracy. And so for the planetary level, uh, I think it is still very utopian, but for me, it was even more utopian before uh, Malala and Greta were born. Uh, but now that they are born, uh, you know, they can uh, take the lead and we can maybe co-construct uh, between our generations and their generations uh, new ways of, of doing this. And so um, I will first uh, give the, the floor to Henrietta that uh, is uh, was just telling us uh, that as a former DG of UNICEF, she sees the world through the eyes of children. So I think that, you know, she has a lot to contribute to this conversation. Henrietta, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francois. Um, so just in listening to you, uh, Francois, I will add in that I often think of citizenship as being the love of a country, but planetizenship should be love of the planet, of the world. So I will add love to your um, expose. So um, on this International Day of Learning, I want to both um, uh, congratulate the Learning Planet Institute and also UNESCO for focusing on learning, because I think it is probably the most important thing that all of us carry throughout our lives. And let me turn to one of its foundations, which is rights. Francois, you and I have spoken about uh, the International Day of Learning and what happened about a hundred years ago in 1924. The League of Nations gathered and they had the foresight to issue a declaration of the rights of the child with the instruction that mankind owes to the child the best that it has to give. So perhaps we should modernize this in our century and we should say that humankind owes the child, the young person and the planet the best that it has to give. So this is our legacy to the next generations and we need them to join us in these rooms and to tell us their hopes and their dreams and the world that they want. Uh, so let me begin and start our conversation with a thought about a few rights that would underlie this. The foundation of planetizenship and citizenship uh, should be built on rights. I'm an American and we started with the Bill of Rights for our nation and thus I think as a first generation for the planet, uh, we might start with rights. So every child, should have the right to a name, a family, and an identity, and a citizenship. They should have the right to primary and secondary school education. They should have a right to primary health care. They should have the right to be free of abuse and harm. They should have the right to clean air, water, land, and a healthy planet ecosystem, and a right to freedom of thought. So as first generation planetizens, we should have at least a connection, a personal connection with one of these rights. Second, with every right comes a responsibility for stewardship, which includes study, solutions, and learning to care for oneself. So second is planetizens take rights as responsibilities to be good stewards. Then third, in 2019, we celebrated the UN General Assembly and of course at UNICEF, the 30th anniversary of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. There are 42 rights, but we have advocated strongly for these rights as a world for the last 30 years. But now in this next 30 years, we need to realize these rights with everyone so that governments and nonprofits and academia and business and their products and services, that all of us have actionable solutions, programs, inventions and innovations. So the third one is that planetizens move from advocacy to realizing rights by carrying out solutions. And fourth, Every planetizen needs to think deeply about their core values. 
At UNICEF, we selected care, respect, integrity, trust, accountability, and sustainability. And we have to think very deeply about our own personal values and our collective values, for they underlie the mobilizing of collective intelligence and the use of technologies. So earlier, Francois, you were talking about care underlying our planet. And I will add that I think respect is extremely important. Respect for people, for planet, and for prosperity. So with that, four calls to action, Francois, I turn it back to you. Thank you. Lovely, Henrietta. I love it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad it's recorded because, you know, uh, I want the script of what you said and I, you know, I think it's a fantastic starting point. Uh, I, I think I'm going to uh, shift the agenda that I had in mind because you started with love of the planet. And I think that, you know, there is someone that I know uh, that had a big smile when you say this, and that's Jean-Pierre. So I'm going to, you know, uh, shift a little at uh, the agenda because I know that you know uh, his love for the planet um, is contagious, and and that he wants to share uh, this. Thank you very much, Francois, and thank you very much, uh, Arita. It was very uh, strong and resonated what you just said. Um, on my side, um, you know, I always felt that uh, facing these pl planetary boundaries, um, the way we need to. Uh, let's say, face these things is not through individualism or super mental things, but by forming a collective and uh, by developing this sense of planetary identity that is missing because it's probably something that we are born with, but that we lose over time um, in uh, our education because we are you know, train or educated to be born in a city and then we built a citizenship or a country identification or cultural identification. But this experience of uh, uh, being a planet is and that's something that is not um, easily accessible. Uh, that's something I felt when I met when I was younger with people that have, uh, you know, crossed the world for three, five years, walked around the world. And these people developed, uh, develop a sense of belonging to all nations, but uh, not everybody can uh, can do that. And uh, 25 years ago, I came across uh, some books uh, written by astronauts where I was totally blown away by the words they were using to describe our planet and the poetic transformation they, 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 they've been through. And uh, they, they were talking like planetes and meaning um, they, they, by seeing the earth from above, they had uh, the impression that this planet was fragile. It was our home, our only home. Uh, around it, there was a vast cosmos, very dark, very, very cold. And we are in a very safe home, you know, in this very gigantic universe. And, and, and they saw our condition. And they were talking about interconnectedness. The, the, the notion of border was totally absent from space. And uh, they developed uh, both a sense of falling in love with the planet and with mankind, you know. And, for me, that was very strong, and uh, I devoted the past 25 years to try to uh, mimic this experience and grow these seeds of love in the heart of the people by uh, living an experience that is similar to what the astronaut uh, lived. So we've founded an NGO called One Home, where uh, we use a very special satellite located one million miles away on a point where uh, on the sur on the Earth sun axis. And it's the only satellite that constantly faces the Earth. And from this satellite, we have built the first videos of the Earth turning seen from space. And by using music and by using inspiring, inspiring text, um, we built this uh, culture of uh, planetary identity and offer people uh, a unique experience to feel like astronauts, but in a, in a space where non astronaut has ever gone because this uh, this point is four times uh, m uh, far away compared to the moon and uh, today for this special day we released a special video we made with francois a call to planetizenship that is available on our website but will also be available on the learning festival and the learning planet institute and uh, you know francois made this call and Seeing the Earth when he makes this call seems seems become logic, you know, because it talks to your heart. It talks as an evidence, and I think this notion of moving from citizenship to platonicism it's somehow I would say engram in ourselves, you know, and like evolution that developed to complexity, we need now to form the next level 
of structure, uh, like when, let's say, uh, cells have gathered together and go from uh, monocellularity to multicellularity, this is the jump we have to do together and form this planetary collective, which I call, because I also write book Homo Biospheris, and uh, this uh, notion of being a gigantic collective that inhabit the Earth could totally change the way we inhabit the Earth, because we, um, the notion of uh, uh, our, the way we relate to the, the world was through ownership, and this will change it to uh, the sense of belonging. So we belong to mankind and we belong to the planet. And the, the mankind is not on top of the planet, it's inside the planet. And we are like an organ on this planet. And that's what we are trying to push with, uh, let's say, uh, this experience and what I'm trying to push with my books on the narrative to kind of build a new story that men and women have to build about ourselves, you know, and, uh, and it's time for that. And stories are a very powerful element for changing beliefs and experience as well. And I think this is wired in our brain and to be activated, we don't need a hammer to hammer that in the mind of people, but something close to that. And love is probably, you know, the, 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 the ultimate form of energy that creates evidence. So that's what we're trying is to spread this love for the planet and for mankind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean-Pierre. Uh, it's uh, very inspiring, uh, everything you do, and I recommend your website. Uh, Lena uh, has been uh, thinking a lot about uh, storytelling and the way you know uh, communities uh, are progressively uh, learning to care for each other at at least at the beginning a local level and progressively at higher scale. Uh, she has a fantastic book I recommend, The Nordic Secrets, that I really uh, enjoyed, uh, and I think that she can you know share with us some of these secrets and and some of the inspirations for the way forward. Lena. Thank you very much. Yes, that is correct. Uh, the Nordic Secret is about adult education in the Nordic countries. A lot of uh, people around the globe look to the Nordic countries because we seem to be doing well on so many parameters. Uh, one of our friends on the Global Bildung Network calls it the achievable utopia. So the question is, how can we achieve uh, more good governance, good uh legal entities for the lack of a better word and uh, how do we how do we have uh, um, successful uh, thriving communities where people feel that they have a, a sense of influence uh, that where they do have influence where they are empowered and where they have freedom and uh, responsibility and everything that Henrietta was was mentioning um, so so we have developed in the Nordic countries uh, Bildung, education for this among young adults. And there is a tendency when we talk about education to focus on children, and that's important, but we also have a lot of adults around the world who need to grasp the 21st century, uh, even the 20th century. We have a, a lacking education around the globe, so we need to focus on all generations. And we need to uh, educate in different ways, depending on age and previous education. So it's a really complex uh, challenge that we have uh, ahead of us and that we're that we're in. With regards to citizenship and planet planet planetizenship planetizenship, uh, I'll have to learn. See, this is a learning experience. So uh, just learning to say this. Um, there, there are a number of issues, and one is, is fundamental meaning making, but also the ability to communicate this. And we're doing this, I don't know how many of us ha, uh, has English as their first language. It's not mine. And one of the challenges that we are facing is just who can actually participate in this conversation. If we look at an advanced technologically and economically advanced continent like Europe, we have united coal and steel for 72 years but we have not made sure that all European citizens can talk to one another. We do not have a shared language across Europe. And so we do need some kind of shared language across the globe before we can have this, I need to learn to say it, planetin, planetisenship. Um, I will, you know, after uh, the end of this uh, se session, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll have learned to say this. So um, we need to... Um, focus on a lot of things simultaneously. And one thing that we also uh, 
uh, I think where we where we succeeded in the Nordic countries was to create a sense of nation and peoplehood that is based on culture. It's not just the ethnic group. Uh, it's not just the geography. It's really about teaching the culture and sharing the culture so that people have shared frames of reference and understand the society that they're in. And we can do that locally and at the national level within a language group uh, where we have a, a a literary tradition where we have media, where we have school systems in a different way than if we go global where we do have to have translation and where we need to think beyond the frames of references that we grew up with. So we need to create multi-layered education that um, appreciates, appreciates and um, develops the local and indigenous culture and language that literally has its roots into the local soil and history. And then the nation state, which is where most of us have our uh, guarantee of our human rights passports. And that's where we have the legal backing of who we are as citizens. And then we have the planetary conversation, the, the planetizenship um, that I'm trying to learn to say. Um, and it would be so tempting to look for a, a global government, but I think that is one of the most terrifying thoughts that you can come up with, because if that turns authoritarian, where do you go as a refugee? So we do need to keep these many different layers, many different entities, the dynamism of having different cultures, different languages, but also being able to bridge them. So I would say we have a very complex, but also very inspiring um, local uh national, continental, and global education and learning uh, challenge, uh, not just ahead of us, but where we are, but also with regards to many different age groups, because we cannot wait until the 12-year-olds and the 17-year-olds grow up um, and can make some of the bigger decisions in politics and also in, in companies and institutions. So that is where we are. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Lena, uh, for these uh, very insightful remarks. Uh, Joff is uh, an expert on many topics, uh, including collective intelligence, but also you know how to uh, enhance imagination individually and collectively, and how to build new sorts of governance. Uh, so I think you know this is exactly the right moment for for Joff to jump into the conversation and and give his own insights. Well, thank you, Francois. Uh, this is such a fascinating question, and I don't really know what to say and what to think uh, but I thought maybe I would try and build on a couple of those those comments I hope we can maybe later get to the very practical questions of what do you do in a school or a university or in a community um, but just standing one step back from that uh, one of the reasons I love Francois Planetism and well, I think that's how you say it you know concept is I think we are in a moment of struggle over this I think in the big scheme of history uh, this idea of global citizenship was talked about a lot in the 19th century. It was crystallized by the photograph of the Earth. It's made manifest by an internet knowledge of climate change. But we're in a strange moment. The World Values Survey, some of you know, does these regular surveys of attitudes and shows the large majorities now actually, in some sense, calling themselves global citizens. But also, they're not sure what that means. And most of them still put the nation ahead of the global when there's a choice. There's a smallish minority who are truly, I think, planetisms, but there are many things going in the wrong direction. And I think we need to be honest about this. So here's three, just to kick us off. So one is that in many parts of the world, probably a majority by population, if anything, education is going in the opposite direction, is re-nationalizing the curriculum in China, in India, in Turkey, it was doing it in, in Brazil, certainly in Russia and reasserting actually a very nationalist view of right and wrong, the soul of the nation, et cetera, et cetera. So let's not, you know, we need a truly global picture of what's happening. Secondly, my perception is amongst many of the people who are the purest planetizens, there's almost a dangerous fatalism about what can be done because so many particularly young people can more easily picture disaster, ecological disaster, AI taking over the world than can picture 
a, a better society a generation or, not, or now from here. This is one of the things I've been working on. How do we actually cultivate that muscle of practical imagination, of welfare, of democracy, of health, of our towns? And I think that's been squeezed out in the last 20 or 30 years, including amongst the very best, the most committed uh, uh, activists who, in a way, we depend on most. And there's a massive mismatch, which I've talked to Francois about before, between where science goes, where our brain power goes, and the needs of the planet. We did a big study with a whole group of partners last year on this and with the UN looking at global R&D and whether it was aligned with the SDGs. And the basic message was it's massively misaligned by where it happens, the tasks, the means, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this a huge task. In a way, it's a century-long task you are, uh, you're embarking on, uh, Francois. And I think for a group like this, the question is, how do we turn that enormous task into something which can become part of the curriculum of, let's say, a primary school, a secondary school, so children are working together in teams on practical problem solving, but which also brings in a sense of history, a sense of other perspectives, a sense of systems and, and complexity. It's one of the things I work on both in, in secondary schools and in universities, but that's going against the grain. Most of our curriculums do the opposite, individualized learning, purely knowledge-based, and nothing of that trinity, which I guess this group would understand between sort of knowing the things you need to know to be a planetism, being how you align your inner and your outer and doing a sort of bias to action uh, in, in the world. So I think we do need a movement, but it's got to make demands of the current gatekeepers, the current owners of the system, who are incredibly slow to move in this direction, very good at paying lip service to it, having the rhetoric right, but essentially doing what they've always done. So I guess my input of this part, let's sort of problematize the question a bit because some of the trends are going in the wrong direction, not the right direction. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, again, very insightful remark. Uh, I'm glad that Keshav is speaking just now because I think that um, he has been pioneering a fantastic work, working with young people on exactly that question of, you know, how do you redesign the system? Uh, how do you uh, invite them to uh, have their own perspective? Because for all the reasons that Geoff was alluding to, there is the, the powerful of the moment uh, don't um, won't change the system by default unless you know they are strongly invited to do so by the next generations. Maybe that will come from you know familial uh, conversations. Maybe that will come from you know societal conversations. Maybe that will come from planetary conversations. Again, before the the birth of Greta and Malala, I would not have been very hopeful. But uh, after I met people like Keshav. Uh, and and I've seen you know what he can do uh, with the younger generations in inviting them to uh, build together the future uh, and to remodel uh, our institutions, which you know have been designed for many of them uh, in 18, 19, or 20th century. Very few have been designed in the 21st century. Uh, so you know those that are born in the 21st century, I think, are um, asking for something else. And inviting them uh, to the table uh, is exactly what Keshav does. So uh, Keshav, uh, please uh, tell us a little more about uh, the, the way you are inviting them to remodel the future. Thanks so much, Francois. Uh, so extremely insightful remarks from, from all, all our uh, speakers so far. So thank you for everything you've shared um, as of now. Uh, I, I think that uh, when I started listening to the idea of planetizenship uh, in the Indian, uh, in our culture, like I think 2000 or more than that, many years back, there was this phrase that was coined in Sanskrit, which was called Vasudev Kutumbakam. That means the world is one family and that comes all the way from, from the Vedas. Uh, and then we see the, then we see doc, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talk about uh, how the world is one large family living in this one, one uh, world house and then we see the united nations uh, the preamble of which starts with we the peoples uh, i think not we the nations so there is a, there has been quite a strong case for for all of us to uh, to look at ourselves in a different way we've become so conditioned to see ourselves in through different identities lenses that we as people start to look for differences rather than similarities in uh, in a lot of us, 
uh, I think Lene was talking about the need for one global language. I think love is that one global language that we should all have, uh, ideally. Uh, but but as as I think Jeff was saying that in in today's world there are so many so many challenges that we face uh, where where we look at the world and it's never been more divided in in so many words. So so what we are working on is uh, we are looking at young people and firstly giving them a platform to express themselves uh, through Model UN, where students take take on roles of uh, diplomats of of various countries and start looking at these global issues, uh, having local implications on uh, in their own communities as well. Now, while we have been doing that as an organization and I've been involved in that process as a as a as an individual, what I noticed was that uh, that because of the current uh, economic political systems, the young people and children are only learning what's already happening, which is looking out for self-interest. And what that does is that even a mock negotiation on climate change uh, in in a forum of young people boils down to the same question as to how I have to protect my economic interests. And you can hear a 16-year-old talk about India's economic interest, hence we should continue to use coal, or we should continue to wage war because X, Y, Z, A, B, C issues. Or you will see people acquiring these values because that's what the society is propagating today. So when the idea of planetizenship, and when, when I started talking to Francois, uh, I realized that this is a wonderful opportunity to, to initiate a radical shift in the values, uh, not just the values, but how we look at ourselves. And that is as planetizens, not as citizens relate. And, and that gives this one common platform to, to relate to each other in a similar common way that is beyond the national boundaries, beyond however anyone wants to label us. Uh, because then we can directly relate ourselves to each other and we can relate ourselves to the nature also. Because a planet, again, like adds this another non-political, I think, uh, I, non-political attribute to ourselves, which is the planet uh, in its natural form and us as human beings uh, before be becoming citizens, taxpayers uh, and, and whatever. So now as a part of this remod, so we started this idea of remodel UN where we are getting these young people to come together and start looking at the values of compassion, start looking at the value of love, creativity, collaboration, rather than divisions, rather than uh, competition, rather than self-interest, and then start looking at how these negotiations, how the problem-solving uh, systems with young people uh, look like. So, so imagine a cop, uh, uh, imagine we, we just had a cop some time back. So imagine young people gathering together for a remodel cop and not following prey to the same sense of ambition and competition uh, and not coming to consensus, but rather presenting an alternative model and outcomes from where we all care deeply about the planet and about each other. Imagine a UN General Assembly which is not hung up on just egos, political interests of one or, or two parties, but rather really trying to solve problems, you know, not, not looking at each other as us versus them, but rather truly solve problems uh, in a way that is good for the mankind, uh, humankind, not just mankind, humankind, I'd say. So, so that is where we are uh, sort of focused on. And what we have seen is that, I think a couple of just last points is that the world is not the same as it was when the United Nations was formed. So the values have changed, but more importantly, the capacity of young people to think, the capacity of young people to act, to put their messages out has radically shifted. With, with this evolution, new challenges have also emerged, uh, but new opportunities for young people have also emerged. And, and Francois has already alluded to Greta uh, and Malala. I think they are, again, inspiring examples of the power that young people hold today, not just not just politically or socially, but even economically as we move ahead. Uh, so, so it is a very opportune time to utilize this, uh, this army of believers to, to mobilize together with all of us and remodel the world and the institutions at the same time that run this world. So, so Francois, thank you for this opportunity and over to you. 
Wow, I'm so impressed by you know the collective intelligence uh, that that has emerged uh, since we've started. I'm I'm really uh, so pleased. I can't wait to see uh, you interact with each other and and rebounds on, on each other's uh, perspective because I think that each of you has has already addressed uh, some very important dimensions. But I think that there is many resonance, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, you all <laughs> can't wait to. To uh, to speak, uh, I'm I'm really uh, seeing that you know uh, the people around here uh, are already uh, very insightful, and that if uh, we were uh, and this is recorded and will be available for everyone, including uh, the young people that this very week are working with Keshav on on this idea of remodel UN uh, and around the idea of planetismship. I think you know this is just the beginning uh, of a conversation and of an adventure. Uh, I agree that you know it might take long, but if this next generation is empowered by the technology and the pedagogies that uh, invite them to uh, do what the pioneers that wrote the UN Charter had sort of, you know, when they wrote the UN Charter, uh, they they wrote many articles. One of them is the 109, and the Article 109 of the UN Charter asked for an upgrade of the way the UN works every 10 years, because they saw that it was, would be the best way for the UN not to become obsolete, because it will be updating on a regular uh, way the way it works. The only problem is that this Article 109 has not been used since the 60s. So uh, I think that the Article 109 uh, and the Remodel UN are entering into a very strong synergy. I think that you know when the UN Secretary General invited the youth to co-construct the future with them, that resonates strongly with what Keshav uh, has just said. So I think there is a window of opportunity for at least uh, the following of this conversation just now, and you know for all those that are listening to us uh, to enter into this conversation and 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 join you know activities such as Remodel UN or, or making love declaration to the Earth and to each other to uh, expand uh, on. Uh, what we have already been said. Um, Henrietta, you were the first one to start. So, you know, maybe you want to, to react first and, and we'll see. Uh, then everyone can raise their hands and I'll give the, you the floor. Uh, thank you, Francois. Yes, I, it was very interesting hearing everyone. So I do have reactions. So um, one of the things uh, to Jeff's point that we hear from children is that they have a voice inside and sometimes they can't hear their own voice or they, they don't know what their voice is. But artificial intelligence and many of the learning programs that are now coming out where you have a, um, a, an artificial or virtual person to talk to, sometimes it brings out that voice. So it's really important to understand that an individual has an inner life and you need as a child to hear your own voice. So that's just one thought. The second thought that we hear from children and young people everywhere is their number one request is a modern education and one that will actually let them have a livelihood. So this gets to Lenny's point about culture. What happens is that children and young people are now worried that they cannot make a living that they can't earn their way. They, they feel we're sitting in their jobs. There aren't going to be enough jobs for them. So they want to learn something that's useful that can actually make them earn, let them earn a living during life. And that usually has a national constraint because of national um, guidelines, legal systems, how to start a business, your own village. It, it draws you in locally to try to be um, a, a, uh, an economic unit in the world of the future. So we're going to have to think through how that economic change, uh, that trans transformation occurs between being a young person and becoming a planetizen. And then thirdly, when I, and when I was listening to uh, Jean-Pierre and Keisha, one of the things that we hear from the children all over the world is it's very helpful if you can just start somewhere so let's say you start with water, which is this wonderful intersection between the global health system and climate. And if you do, there are um, classrooms in Nepal who go out into the neighborhoods and they're looking for environmental hazards and they're thinking about water. Um, I'm a sailor, I go out on the ocean and it's the experience of the astronauts, 
you cannot believe how beautiful and big our world is, our globe when you're out to sea and you do not see land anywhere. But when you come back in, you realize that 700 children a day die of um, diarrheal diseases from poor water. A billion people are without drinking water, clean drinking water. Half the planet in two years, Francois, will be short of water. So take a subject that unites all of Lenné's cultures and talk about it and see if you can come up with some solutions. It makes you into a planetizen because you can't do it any other way. So that's the thought. Leno. Yeah, um, I would say uh, the school systems that we know today are uh, not just a product of the industrialized society, they are uh, industry uh, factories of uh, pouring content into the head heads of children and if i were to design a school that should obstruct learning in the most efficient way i would gather anywhere between uh 25 and 40 uh, children in a too small room where i forced them to sit down for 45 minutes at a time and i would group them according to age not interest not talent not you know uh natural inclinations or in interest in any way and then I would uh, require that they would uh, not say anything and just listen to the teacher and only say something if anybody asked them or they got permission to talk. I mean, the way that we've structured schools uh, are, it, it's just so much against what it means to be a child. Um, so, so we need to find out how do we give children the knowledge that they need and the knowledge that they're interested in learning and how do we bridge that gap between the two because sometimes you do have to learn stuff that doesn't seem interesting at all um but you also need to uh you know be heard and seen and have that inner voice respected and received so that you feel it is actually worth being here because they do care about me um i think one of the most uh, universal things that we can teach children is actually to relate to the soil and to food production and to water and the resources in, in their local community. And that looks very different in among the Inuits in Greenland or Canada and in the middle of Africa or on a, I don't know, in a desert in the Middle East or in China. But it, it's fundamentally human to relate to the, the ground that you're on and, and the kind of food that can grow there or not grow there, but the animals that can help you get it. So I think that fundamental part of being human is actually universal. And once you understand that, and once you can cook a meal, you also have something that you can share with people from other parts of the world. So I think we need to combine what we already have because it, it, it has been an important phase in, in the development of education. But there was something before that that was indigenous and pre-modern and was aesthetic and natural and built on small communities. Um, and then there is something that we need to create for the future, which is fundamentally different. So uh, so again, many different layers and many different aspects. But I think the, the fundamental, fundamentally human part about relating to to the earth um, and what the, where food comes from is, is crucial. I can't wait to react, but uh, Jean-Pierre has uh, raised his hand also, also so I'll, I'll let him. Yes. It's, it's, thank you very much for, you know, this idea about, uh, you know, where could we start with education? And of course, it depends on context, etc. But, uh, you know, starting with soil and uh, nature is, uh, you know, something logic. And if I may, I will push this even further because, uh, you know, growing food is a great way to... Um, let people reconnect to the magic of the world, you know, and to put themselves in the state, in a state of wonderment, you know, and uh, I think we have lost that, or we do everything for children to lose that. They have that initially, you know, they talk to trees, they talk to cats, they talk to rivers, they talk to, and then they forget about that, you know, and, um, and I, I think the, 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 just being alive, just being, you know, part of this planet is something totally magic, you know, and, uh, you know, I would dream to have a, a course on the wonderment, you know, where, you know, they teach you like, uh, amazing stories about what's going on in this forest, you know, how, you know, uh, 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 flowers bloom, you know, how roots uh, get soil, you know, to, 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 to make the world 
a living thing and something very exciting to be within, you know, and, you know, they will look at it as a marvel, you know, and I think, you know, you don't need to go to space with that. Space gives this collective perspective that could glue us together. But I think at a local level, you know, you if you just name things and you just say, okay, this is this, this is that, and, um, you know, really exciting. And when I give uh, conferences to children, I try to put them in this state of wonderment and they reconnect to that instantly, you know, I think. And the more people uh, age, I think they lose that, but you can put even adults in this state of wonderment. And I would say the second pillar for me for education will be wonderment, but also uh, vulnerability, because when you are uh, in um, uh, facing this nature that is so magic, uh, the other thing that strikes you, and that also strikes you from space, is the vulnerability of that, so that you care, you know, so that, okay, you like this flower, but it can, it can break, you know, you like this uh, butterfly, it has a heart, this heart can stop uh, uh, pulsating, and, uh, you know, if we had courses on wonderment and courses on uh, vulnerability, people will be amazed and also respect and, you know, they will develop a sense of sacred, you know, something that is very, um, you know, you are lucky to be here and uh, your relationship with the world takes another dimension. And, and, uh, and I agree with you, this should not be just for children, but also for adults. And um, the, 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 what we do with the planet gives that at a you know, global scale, but at a local level, I think, yeah, we, we, we can really uh, uh, totally change that and reorganize the way we teach things ar around that, you know. And uh, uh, I had that as a child where some of our professors were, uh, you know, uh, uh, putting us in nature and explaining certain things about the stars, about how mountains were forming. And this is really missing, you know, and, uh, and, and celebrating just being part of that world in education could be a glue of a program and something very excited where at the local level you connect and then you add also this uh, uh, sense of belonging to a more global identity and uh, yeah this should work you know but of course it's the opposite of uh, the way we do education which is you know uh, a byproduct of the labor industry to uh, bring formatted citizen into their pipes you know, so jeff uh, you ra you raise your hand yeah, well, so picking up on what Jean-Pierre just said, I think one of the fascinating things about learning is often we learn best when we're quite uncomfortable <laughs> and through difficult experiences which stretch us, make us feel vulnerable. And this is always a challenge in designing learning so it doesn't just reinforce uh, uh, assumptions. And I think it relates to the fractal nature of planetizenship, which isn't just about looking upwards to the world or to, to space, it's also looking at our own society in a different way. I've just been doing a little bit of research on truth and reconciliation commissions, which began in places like South Africa and Colombia. But now most of the countries which used to think of themselves as the most progressive in the world, like I think you know, Norway, Sweden, I don't think Denmark's got one, Canada, they've all got ones underway about their own indigenous populations and in a way renegotiating the local version of what citizenship is in quite different ways from a uh, hundred years ago. Two other just comments prompted by what others said. So one is about, for me, one of the remarkable things about education systems is their ability to ignore quite strong evidence on what actually works in learning. So for example, we know a huge amount that you know children learn most through argument and dialogue, not just sitting passively in a classroom. We know they learn better outside than inside, but they're never allowed to go outside. We know we learn better when we're moving than when we're stationary in seats. We know we learn better when we apply things in practice than when we don't. And yet 95% of education ignores all of that vast amount of evidence just because it's not very convenient. And I think that relates to one of the things Henrietta said. I think we have a, a dual challenge in this whole field of what I call lines of sight. One of those lines of sight is a personal one. How do you relate what you're learning to some sense of your future job, your career, your earnings, and so on? And in many countries, that line of sight 
has gone. I mean, the US half the population has had no income gain now for what 40 years, is it? Uh, in my country, it's basically stopped for 15 years. And it's not surprising young people really struggle to see, as I say, a, a, a positive route into the future. Why bother learning if there's no prospect of a decent job? And there's an equivalent for our society, the line of sight which connects what you might do in your home or your street or your neighborhood to these bigger uh, societal and global challenges. And that's why for me, climate change and decarbonization needs to very quickly become a question of what do you do, like in your own home, your own food you know, consumption, your own high street, rather the abstractions of cops. Uh, and in a way that's, I think, quite doable in education, but most education systems don't turn these big things into tractable, manageable, project-based learning, and which then pulls in the science, the geography, the maths, and so on, to help solve problems. So flipping on its head the traditional uh, sort of knowledge transfer model of learning. And that, I think, helps then to solve the line of sight problem. Thank you, Jeff. Keshav. I think one key part of learning is uh, that we learn from each other uh, in, in classrooms, outside classrooms, while we're talking to each other. We, as students, try to tell each other these little hacks uh, for, for certain things that we sometimes we're struggling with. Or imagine like being in a sports team with your peers and then there's something about your technique that's not working out. But then one of your team members will tell you that, look, this is what we got to do. Uh, but what that... What that sort of leads me to think is about these two things. One is the importance of peer-to-peer -peer learning and in schools and universities to create ecosystems which, which, which sort of facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning. And secondly, to recognize that as an important part of learning. Because what we have done right now is we have, st we have put so much value on these, uh, on grading and putting these important sort of evaluations to only learnings through curriculums that 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 we have that we are sort of delivering unilaterally to to children that we are sort of somewhere never able to gauge how much they have learned from each other and and the more we go outside of our classrooms into our real life in our jobs in our real world we see that learning from each other and just simply having the ability to talk to each other and collaborate with each other becomes one of the most important skills, whether you're the Secretary General of the United Nations, the President of a country, or uh, wherever you are at any other hierarchy. So that's, that's one, I think, very important part about planetizenship, where you can relate to any other human being or any, any part of, in any part of the world or, or nature and its creations. Uh, the second one quick anecdote I want to share is uh, I was working with the the learning planet council members last year on an intercultural communication workshop and we had these two two, two young people from like, leaders one from leo and one from paris and then we had a couple of them from U, from the us uh, upstate new york and somewhere and once we started talking to each other and and really getting to know each other we realized that uh, that somebody from paris and new york could relate more to each other's lifestyles and the way things were happening uh, simply because they were living in very fast cities. And we had always thought that it would be the other way around that the French people would be able to relate to each other in a, in a French way and then the Americans would, would do that. But then we saw over, over the year that these strong bonds uh, started forming, uh, not on the basis of nationalities uh, and, and geographical locations, but these ecosystems that we were more part of. And I think with this uh, evolution of digital media, and youth being more and more, uh, you know, being present and affected by digital media, the scope of intermingling uh, and and choosing your own communities has 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 come about a lot more. So people can relate to their Instagram followers or TikTok or Snapchat community more than just their local area. So how do we create planetizenship in a digital ways, or how do we rec real uh, like take these digital tools and then uh, look at planetizenship is a, a very interesting uh, space as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keshav. Uh, I, I've seen Lena raising her hand. Uh, I think there is, there'll be about two minutes each uh, for the next round uh, of uh, conversation. I just wanted to, to resonate with uh, what has been said by, by each of you. Um, indeed, 
uh, defining what we should learn as planetizen is is uh, an open question and and a very good question and I don't think I have an answer even though you know we heard uh, many interesting pieces. Uh, I want to highlight a few. Uh, hints that we might uh, consider in this exercise. Uh, first, um, during the Transforming Education Summit, 500,000 uh, young people had written a use declaration, and they have been very clear about what they want. Uh, there is 25 items, and I think you know we should start there, uh, because that's what they want. Uh, that's the first point. The second point is that I think that you know there are universal things that we should uh, relate to somewhat easily. Uh, you know, where do we come from? Where are we? Uh, are things that have been universal uh, in our history, but uh, and where are we going? Are is a universal concern as well? But where do we come from uh, today? Science has some pretty good answers, uh, from the you know Big Bang to the apparition of life on this planet to its evolution, etc. So I think you know there is a lot of uh, things that is common knowledge for you know any planetism i guess um i think you know where we are i think the unsdg is a very interesting framework for defining the challenges and then you know i think Henrietta, lena and, and others uh, you've been raising uh, some of those challenges that are definitely uh, linked to sdgs and and those challenges are also uh, very universal they have different you know the water problem is not the same everywhere and the food problem and, and so on but those problems are are planetary problems and we can learn to to solve them and i think you know the pedagogy of solving challenges might be one of the universal that we would like every planet to have because if they can solve their personal challenges and their local challenges progressively they will learn to uh, find solutions to uh, ever bigger challenges such as the global challenges we all face so i think you know that might be uh, some elements and in terms of you know building a narrative um, we also have uh, some universal storytelling uh, schemes such as the hero's journey of joseph campbell that he's seen uh, across civilizations and culture and and geographies and and history and so inviting everyone to follow uh, their own hero's journey uh, their own planetism journey. You know, what are their emotions? Why is it complicated uh, to overcome those feelings? Uh, how to uh, start exploring uh, the knowledge that exists around, including uh, in the digital age, uh, including in the, in the machines and, and so on. You know, how can they start doing this? How they can transform themselves? How can transform their interaction with others? How can they transform uh, the way they see the world and the way they act on the world and the way they contribute to the world? And then, you know, how can they contribute uh, to their local communities and to the global needs? I think, you know, if we help every uh, kid to um, go through their hero's journey, if they can find their ikigai, where they can find an intersection between what the world needs, what they love to do, what they can learn how to do, and the resources that they can find in their environments and in their communities, both local and global communities, I think we'll have done some steps towards uh, providing them with a planet and education. Lena, you, you wanted to react? Yeah, there's one thing that we haven't mentioned uh, so far at all, which is play, um, which is uh, something that children do naturally, and it's one of the best ways to learn. But it also has an, uh, a number of qualities that are actually very um, sought for in, in the current uh, job market, which is uh, the ability to cooperate. It's open-ended. It uh, requires creativity that you uh, can feel where the others are in the game and the play that you're playing so um the game that you're playing so the uh it, it's usually looked at as some kind of waste of time that you do in in intermissions but it's really one of the most uh, crucial ways for us to learn and a lot of scientists uh describe their research as play because it's it's a uh, not exactly goofing around with the material, but but uh, researching and trying to come up with new hypotheses and um, testing out stuff before you you know start doing the serious lab work or the research in depth is is a playful process. So I think we need to bring play back into school and not organize it for the children because then it becomes oh now we got to play from uh, nine to ten o'clock in the morning and we got these four games that you need to you know walk through then it's not play then it's another different kind of work so the the open-endedness and the uh, joy and the playfulness of play is really crucial not just in childhood but also in adulthood 
Thank you, Lena. Uh, I'm, I'm sure others would want to react, uh, as Jean-Pierre. Uh, I think, you know, indeed, we have to change the game. Um, you know, we are playing a lose-lose game at a planetary level and learning, you know, game theory uh, in a very applied way uh, through play uh, very early on, uh, I think is going to be one of the useful skills uh, that we should be learning. Uh, Jean-Pierre. Yeah, um, you know, definitely, uh, you know, game theory and, you know, having kids uh, playing with, uh, you know, the, the prisoner dilemma and trying to see how collaboration, communication can get them out of traps, you know, uh, I think this could be very meaningful. But um, rebounding on what you were just saying, uh, Lena, uh, what, what I experience sometimes when I present this image of the earth to children, I do small workshop with them where I ask them to draw a living planet. And uh, they understand that this is actually very complex. So they use a lot of colors. And sometimes, you know, their planet is too small, it's too big, you know, it's too hot, it's too, too liquid, too gathers, and um, or it, it, didn't, it doesn't have many colors. And they realize the, the wonder of having the earth, you know, as beautiful, as complex as a living system. And uh, drawing, you know, is part of play as well. And you could also ask them to to draw um, a living ecosystem at a local level. You know, what do you need to, and this ecosystem could be between plants and animals, but it also be a human ecosystem. You know, you need some stores, you need some, uh, uh, you know, uh, energy, you need these things. And uh, there are many um, games uh, uh, that have been invented to kind of design these things. And kids love to do this kind of uh, play to develop a culture of, uh, relationship so that they understand that it's not isolated things it's the links you know that uh, bond things together and uh, playing could be a great way of learning that you know and uh, which is very difficult because your sense don't show you the bounds between things and uh, by drawing by playing you could you could guess that you know yeah fully agreed um so uh, we have six minutes. Geoff, uh, Keshav, Arieta, if you want to say a few last remarks, don't hesitate. All right, I'll, I'll start. Um, so one area that you started with, uh, Francois, was um, that children's voices and women's voices often are not heard. One of the things I think we have begun to see is that sometimes giving uh, a skill certificate to a child or a woman or a young person can give them a sense of uh, knowledge and of um, accreditation and um, confidence that they can show it to someone else and they could believe that that person knows something because often it's a lack of self-confidence that as a child or as a young woman, you don't, you don't know that you know enough. So a certificate is really a good idea. So that maybe in thinking about being a planetizen, uh, Francois, you ought to think about some sort of skill certificates um, so that you would know that you'd accomplished something. Um, the second one is to Keshav's point about digital communities. It's going to be really important to put in Jeff's idea about feeling uncomfortable, that the communities uh, virtual are, are um, mixed, are diverse. So uh, as you were thinking through how to do that, the diversity of that of those uh, digital connections and communities is going to be terribly important. I love starting with the 25 areas that the young people have outlined, but to your point, it's really important that they get translated now into solutions. And um, lastly, parents and teachers. If parents and teachers don't know about being a planetizen, uh, it will make it very hard on the children. So teach the parents and the children also. Thank you. Thank you, Arietta. Keshav or Jeff? Jeff? Okay, mind. I'll go first. So yeah, I agree with all that's been said. And maybe just to bring it down to one thing, which is place, because although the planet is out there, we, we live in real places. And this is prompted by the fact tomorrow I've got to do an event in the town where I live, which is a fairly poor town in England called Luton, where we have a few hundred people talking about 20 years time, what should the strategy be, etc. 
I think we need these kind of exercises all over our societies, which unlock the imagination, looking a generation or two into the future. They hardly happen at all in most places. And where they do happen, it's very unusual for young people to have a big say in them, even though, you know, a 10 year old today may well live to 100 or 110 and 2040 is actually a rather short time uh, ahead. And one of the things I'll be saying in, in that gathering is let's not just simulate as it were, power, the exercise of citizenship, we ha it has to be real, you know, give some, they don't have to be very big, but some small budgets for school kids to have control over, to allocate, to be responsible for, give them maybe bits of land to be responsible for. I think citizenship is at its worst is taught as a purely sort of pedagogical classroom thing. It has to be real. And it's through exercising the muscle of power that we get real citizens, not as it were, pretend ones. Uh, yeah, I think my my one concluding reflection is that the theme of the Learning Planet Festival is learning to take care of oneself, others, and the planet. Uh, one core skill or or the core co uh, one core attribute of planetizenship could be learning to learn about oneself, others, and the planet. I think if we start teaching people how to learn about oneself, others, and the planet, that also includes empathy. Uh, love and compassion. Uh, I think that that can be a not a skill, but a very important value to start planetizenship uh, with. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think that you know we've we've heard a lot, and uh, and all of this resonates deeply uh, with the very idea of planetizenship. And I hope with uh, not only the people in the panel, but also the the audience and the people that will be watching this later. Uh, it really uh, resonated um, in in so many dimensions. I'm sure that there'll be a lot of follow up conversations uh, among ourselves and among you know everyone interested in in these ideas. I think that uh, we are just at the the beginning uh, of an adventure, but uh, I really uh, appreciated some of what was said uh, just now. I think we have to start local, uh, personal, but we have to connect uh, to oneself. We have to connect to others. We have to connect to the planet. Uh, we have amazing technology to do this. Okay, We could have had a climate crisis without an internet and without satellite showing us how beautiful our planet is. And I think our awareness would have been very, very different. Uh, but we have a chance. Uh, and I, I don't know many uh, planets like ours exist uh, in the galaxy or in the universe, but we know for that this one um, has, uh, is somewhat special, at least to us. Uh, and, and I think that by knowing about it, by caring for it, by loving it, uh, and by, you know, uh, acknowledging, uh, I, I really like what you're saying it, uh, about acknowledgement of, of each of our contributions. Uh, I think we can all learn to become good ancestors. Uh, you know, one of the things that really um, struck me the most was uh, when I read this poem that says, what did you do when you knew? Uh, I think, you know, we can all become responsible, uh, not just responsible, but able to respond uh, to such a question. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, I, I was talking to, to some young people that have a anxiety and that have, you know, some of their... Uh, grandparents in palliative care and you know some of their nightmares is you know what would we do if the planet was entering palliative care would we finally have uh, a more holistic understanding but would it be too late or you know in, and if we want to avoid that nightmare can we have that holistic understanding before it's too late uh, before we arrive in the terminal stage uh, of our planetary life um, so can we uh, collectively invent uh, something can we collectively invent narratives uh, I love the thousand and one night, for instance. Okay, uh, can we have a thousand and one planetism uh, nights and dreams and nightmares, and and can we weave in uh, storytelling uh, that can be engaging? Uh, and and can we have you know the, all the variations in all the cultures and all the the places that resonate between the very local and the planetary level, the very personal and and the humankind perspective, and actually all the living organism? Uh, can we learn to do this? Uh, I think it's Again, just the beginning of the conversation. Uh, it's the end for <laughs> our panel. Uh, and I see Kristen is uh, ready to uh, uh, take over. But uh, I think that uh, we will probably have many follow-up conversation. This was uh, the first uh, in a, hopefully a long series of planetizenship seminars. 
Uh, and you know, you're all invited to uh, come again to the next series of seminars on proposed topics, proposed speakers that uh, you believe will resonate, invite young people that uh, you believe uh, should be heard uh, on this uh, very topic. So I think it's um, an amazing session for me. I'm, I'm so glad that you've all contributed. I'm so glad that the organizers have helped us uh, in the Learning Planet Festival team uh, organize this beautiful gathering of, of Planet Design's Mind. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Just very much to Francois and to all of your guests for that great session on citizenship to planetizenship. As a reminder, you'll be able to find and replay all the LPTV sessions on our YouTube channel. And you can also access lots of our other Learning Planet videos from the past festivals and from our gatherings throughout the year. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss anything. At the Learning Planet Festival and throughout the festival, we are uniting to transform education and to create learning societies. What does that mean? For us, our baseline says it all. Learning to take care of oneself, others, and the planet. Being planetizens, collaborating and co-creating to find solutions to the complex issues we face today and in the future. Now let's hand the mic again over to the next generation and hear from some of our engaged youth that are active in Japan and the UK. Please welcome Ryo Tanabe, representative of the Youth Learning Planet Youth Council, and Gauri Kanan, Learning Planet Youth Fellow and representative of the DAIS Model Global UN. Gauri, Rio, over to you. Rio, Hi, Gary, are you with us? Yeah. Handing the mic over to you. Okay. So, hi, my name is Rio from Japan, and um, I'm going to talk about my experience um, about like learning planets. So, since I joined the um, youth youth council, I have become a more international and open-minded person. Uh, there are many intelligent, like passionate and respectful people from all over the country. Um, in the youth council. They have their own background and experience. Thus, talking with those people always inspire me. Um, I think the youth council is a great place to deepen your interest because my project, which is providing sanitary products to Pakistan, uh, actually began from the youth council because when I was looking for members to my project, a couple of people from Youth Plan uh, Learning Planet messaged me saying that they wanted to join my project. One of them is actually in Pakistan now, so I can obtain real and accurate information from there. What is wonderful is that Gauli here is also one of the members in my project. I would have never thought that I would be able to expand my project that much before I joined the Youth Council. There are many people who are doing similar things to me. So it's a great thing that I can share my experience uh, with those people. Since the Youth Council is filled with international people, I can learn social issues from many different perspectives. For example, I live in Tokyo and I rarely feel poverty near me. However, listening to stories from other people in developing countries, um, I always realized that what I'm hearing from the news is real. There are many social issues in this world. Some of them even enlarge in inequality in our society and lead to poverty. What if we could all come together to take actions to diminish these social issues? I believe a learning planet can be the place. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Okay, I think we still have you on the screen. Who's next, Gary? <laughs> Hello, um, can you hear me? 
So uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Gori, and I'm a Learning Planet Youth Fellow and a representative of the DAIS Global Voices MUN, um, a festival which will be starting on the 27th of January. So do look out for that. Um, so I I'm from the UK. And when I joined the Youth Fellow program in March of last year, I was amazed to have the opportunity to connect with talented game changers who are passionate about global causes. Um, and I was also exposed, uh, exposed to a plethora of resources and a platform, especially on which to share my ideas. So as Rio mentioned, we have a chat, we have um, an online project area where we can share our ideas and get involved, which made it really easy for me to get involved in uh, Rio's project, um, addressing period poverty in Pakistan. Um, in the past, I have engaged in various projects at school, such as, you know, empowering women in not only the academic setting, so, you know, doing talks on women in economics, for example, which is a subject that I take to a higher level, um, but also, you know, empowering women in their in their social setting, uh, addressing things like violence against women um, and how we can combat that, especially in our school setting. Um, but I've also, you know, delivered talk to students, talks to students and parents about psychological literacy, mental well-being. So I really, um, my area of interest has really been um, the, the third SDG, which is, um, you know, global mental health and well and physical health. So. While these have been productive on a local scale, I feel that in my time as a youth fellow, I have been able to get involved with initiatives led by students all around the world whose ventures have had an international impact and who have broadened my knowledge with their unique perspectives and experiences. Um, not only have I been able to have more of an international impact this way, but I've also learned a lot of new skills myself. So when I was previously assisting Rio, so our, our previous speaker with, um, with combating period poverty in Pakistan, Pakistan, I learned so many online skills like logo and website design, um, as well as raising awareness and, and fundraising about the cause. Um, currently, I'm working to market the Global Voices MUN, which I mentioned earlier to my peers, uh, my MUN society at school, um, and also the, the people that I know in in my social sphere outside of school, um, because I think it has a really important international theme, which which is the theme of the Learning Planet Festival, which is to take care of oneself, others, and the planet. Um, and joining youth fellows and getting involved with projects with Rio and Global Voices MUN, for example, these these initiatives have helped me take the first steps to becoming a planet citizen. Um, you know, citizen working with other people from around the world to overcome personal, local, and global challenges, and having a say, no matter how big, in shaping the earth that we're all going to live in together. Um, and yes, so thank you. Thanks to Rio and Gary for joining us and sharing your thoughts on planetizenship and on what your work and the Model UN. If you want to hear more from people like Rio and Gary, then make sure you join our Discord server to connect and chat with the Learning Planet Youth Council and fellows. And be sure to check out our sessions on Saturday, where youth and planetizens take over the stage here at the festival with dedicated events, workshops, exhibits, stories, poetry, and much, much more taking place throughout the day. In just a short while here on LPTV, we'll be welcoming a planetizen who is also one of the best science fiction writers in the world. But first, we want to hear from you and for you to tell us what helps you imagine a more positive future for our planet. Is it perhaps reading books and comics, watching films and series? Perhaps you prefer writing or dance or art, or is it talking and sharing with your friends? Use the QR code next to this live stream to tell us what sparks your imagination. And I'll share your responses with us in just a short while. Mm -hmm.